All right. Let's give a bigger hand clap to God for that. Yeah. yeah. So welcome, everybody here. Um, we got some new faces, so look to the neighbor next to you and say, uh, welcome to Dayspring. Got a bunch of new faces, praise God. Welcome to everybody who's tuning in online today. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope that you have a blessed encounter with God today. Who's expecting something great today? Who's expecting something great this morning right now at church? Praise God. Expecting to hear a word from God. I'm praying that he will use me. Um, I do want to encourage everybody to get into the uh, challenge that we have. Um, I wanted to change it this morning to faithful and fat because I gained some weight. But I was told I can't. And so... I got to tell you something before we get into the message today. So I had three people, they came and tempted me with the flesh, and I gained weight. They took me out to eat, and I'm not going to point them out, but they're all around over here. And I said, man, you know, what did I do this week? How did I gain two and a half pounds? So, unfortunately, I can't change the name to Faithful and Fat or else I'd win. <laughs> Faithful and Fit, so I got four weeks to lose all the weight that I gained this week. Thanks, Timothy. I appreciate you, man. Ivan, thank you, man. I appreciate you. Ivan did it too, man. Ivan did it too. Look at this. He's back there with a big old greasy bag. Man. And it's the guys who are doing it. They want to beat me. I was talking all that trash, man. Golly. Okay. All right. No counseling for men this whole week, okay? <laughs> All right, so praise God. Listen, thank you all so much for tuning, uh, being here with us today. We're going to continue with our It's Time series. And, uh, you know, we've talked about some good things. It was time to be different. It was time to fight temptations, part one and part two. And today we're going to talk about it's time to trust God first. Boy, trust is a big, big issue in human history, trusting God and all of us trust something, or we trust someone. When you go to the bank, you trust that when you put your debit card in, that you're going to get some money out. They're going to have your, your money in there. That's assuming you know what your balances are, right? <laughs> but you assume the bank is going to have your money. You assume that the schools are going to teach your kids and keep them safe. This morning, you got in your car and you assumed it was going to start, right? You trusted those things. You trusted the teachers. You trusted your bank. Maybe you're the type of person who just trusts yourself, your experiences, your knowledge, and what you can do. Or maybe you're the type of person that just trusts everybody else, and you don't trust yourself. But I just want you to think about this today during this message is, what do you trust first? Or who do you trust first? Trust, it means to put your full belief or your confidence into something or someone. That's what trust is. Trust is the foundation to any relationship inside the church and outside of church. But especially for Christians, trust is the foundational building block for us with God. And, you know, you're told at the moment that you give your life to the Lord, you know, you got to trust God. Everywhere you're hearing, you're seeing the scriptures, and we'll get into this in a second. You can stop trusting your way of life and trust God and your songs that are written about it. It was one of the lyrics in the songs we had today. In children's church, you have trust God, trust God, trust God. And that could be hard, though. And before we get into the main scripture, which will be in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, I'm going to talk about some of the reasons it could be hard. Some people, I said, they give 100% trust right away to everything and everybody. And other people, it's zero. So for those who give the zero, typically it's because you've been through something or someone has broken your trust. Could have been a physical abuse, sexual abuse. Could have been betrayal by a spouse or a partner. Could have been all these things, maybe a business partner. There's so many reasons why, but when something hurts really deeply, you stop trusting. And then human nature will be, well, I'm going to protect myself from being hurt again. So if I was hurt from a doctor, well, all doctors are like that now. I'm not going to trust any doctor. If I was hurt from a pastor, well, then all pastors are like that. I'm not going to trust them. If I was hurt from a woman, I'm not going to trust anyone. I mean, on and on and on and on. That's a little bit unfair to those people, but it's also robbing you of a life, a blessed life that God has for you. So what I want you to focus on today, though, is not trusting people, because that's a whole other sermon in itself, but trusting God 
first. In one marriage conference that we did um, many years ago, probably 12 years ago, I think it was actually one of the first ones we did, I remember my wife, she said, you know, I had this hard time trusting my husband. I thought one day he was going to just find somebody better than me, prettier than me. And y'all know my wife. I mean, come on, really? Could somebody like this find something better? Honestly, the answer is no. But she had her own, you know, her reasons, right? So she was talking about this. So she said, from the time we started dating as teenagers all the way up through her 20s, she just had a hard time trusting me. But it was because she was putting her trust in the wrong place. When she learned to trust God, that's when she started trusting. This is what she said. When I trusted God, I trusted God to take care of my husband so that he wouldn't go and stray and do all of these things. But as long as I put my trust in him, she was telling me, I asked her just the other day, yesterday, she said, I put you on this pedestal that you could never reach. And it's impossible, but it's not impossible for God to be up there. So now she trusts God to take care of me, her kids, grandkids, church, and on and on and on. She's looking to the first place to trust is God. And so now let's get into our main scripture for today because trust is a big deal. It's mentioned almost 200 times in the Bible. So do you think if God talks about trust that many times, it's a an, it's an big deal? Yes, it is. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs is the book of wisdom written by Solomon, King Solomon. And so here we go, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. I want to tell you why I chose this version, first of all. I'll start with, uh, let's just start with verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. With all your heart, how do you do something with all your heart? What is that made of? See, your heart directs your life. It directs your choices. Your heart has your thoughts, the words, the actions, your heart, what's in your heart comes out in your life. So to trust God with all of that, with my thoughts to trust God with them, with my emotions to trust God with them, with my choices to trust God with them, and to trust my life. That's what he's talking about. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Now, for those who are analytical, who think, are deep thinkers, who maybe overanalyze and analyze and analyze things, and I'm one of those you can start trusting your own understanding. Well, it happened to me before this way, so it's going to happen to me like that again. History says if that happens, this happens. If that person says something like that, they're probably like this. If they dress this way, this is going to happen. If you, you see where I'm going with that? You're leaning on your own understanding. Where has that gotten you so far in your life? Your own understanding. Has it led to heartbreak? Has it led to disappointment? Has it led to you putting your foot in your mouth? When you put your foot in your mouth, it's because you're leaning on your own understanding instead of trusting in the Lord with all your heart. And it's a hard thing to trust with all your heart, especially if something or someone has broken that trust. It's traumatic. When a traumatic experience happens, when somebody gets betrayed, the death of a loved one, those things can change the chemical makeup of your mind, the way you think, the way you see the world, the way things happen, and it changes the way you feel. And so in that way, it's hard to say, God, I can't trust you because I feel this way, because I think this way, because that happened. How could such a loving God be somebody that I could trust with all my heart? I don't know if you've ever asked those types of questions or you've had those types of conversations with God, but if you have, then I'm hoping that today will help you with that. Amen? In verse 6, it said, in all your ways, submit to him. The reason I chose this version instead of the acknowledging him is a big deal. Acknowledge. I can acknowledge. There's my son. There's Steve. Alex did the audio today. I'm acknowledging them. But to submit is completely different. In all your ways, submit. Submit means to surrender, to give up the rights to. See, if I acknowledge, that's different. But if I submit my thoughts, submit my feelings, submit my actions, submit my words, submit my life to God, that's a completely different thing than just acknowledging it. It says, and then the promise is that he will make your paths straight. How many people have been on a bumpy road in their life? 
<laughs> potholes everywhere, zigzagging. You thought it was a straight shot. Man, I'm going to get that job. And all of a sudden, you're working over here. You know, <laughs> stuff like that happens, right? But when you submit everything to God, it's because you trust him with all your heart. And he's the one that makes your paths straight. Now, if I ask a group of people who are struggling with things, and I'm sure that there's something that everybody in here is struggling with today, would you want God to make that straight? Would you want God to fix that? Most people will say yes. Yeah, of course I do. He can do it like this, right? He created Saturn. He created the heavens. He created the earth. He created all the universe. He created all these animals, so he could definitely do it. Yes, he can. But you must trust in the Lord with all your heart to see all of these things. The Bible is so great. It's so great to read it because it tells you what will happen if you do this and what will happen if you don't. The devil don't tell you that. We learned that about temptations for the last two weeks, right? The devil only says this looks good, it feels good, it must be good. He doesn't say if you do all of that, these are the things you're going to lose. God tells you everything. He gives you the big picture. That is reason enough alone to trust that he doesn't need anything from us. I had this one guy I used to work with. He would tell people, man, I don't want your business. I need your business. There's a big difference. God doesn't need us. He wants us. He wants us to be with him in heaven, but he doesn't need us to be in heaven. If we're not there, it's still going to be filled with love and peace and joy and all of his children, that the name of Jesus, everybody will bow down and start singing and worshiping, that everything, there's no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. He doesn't need us to, for that to happen, but he wants us to be there for that to happen. You see the difference? So do you want that trust or do you need that trust? Do you want it or do you need it? It's a choice, brothers and sisters. Trusting God with all of your heart will change everything in your life. And there's many reasons that people don't trust God at first or at all. Some of the other reasons are is they're very self-reliant. I want you to think about yourself as I'm talking about these, and I'll get into more scripture in a minute. I don't trust God because I rely on myself. I've done it. I know how to do it. You know, I say that I rely on God, you know, but I do it, and then I'll say, good job, right, God? When we were building this stage after the first um, flood, you remember everybody, the walls who were here, the walls were all down, no stage here. I remember me and Joe were in here, and we were talking, we were doing stuff, and we got a few hours into it, and I said, you know, we're doing this for God, but we're not doing it with God. There's a big difference. So we stopped, put on the worship music, we prayed, and man, then we were able to build it with so much peace, and it just went faster. See, there's a big difference, right? I could have just relied on myself, Joe's experience, you know, he's a home builder, he knows how to do this stuff, but then it wouldn't have had the same impact. So that's one of the things that stops us from trusting God is that we rely on ourselves. Or the other one is that we rely too much on other people. As soon as a problem happens, boom, hey, uh, what do you got? You know, uh, what do you think I should tell her, man? I, I really want to kick her out, you know, right now. And him, I, I, I want to strangle him, his underwear on the floor again, you know? And what do you want me, what should I do? And these kids are driving me crazy. I mean, what, what should I do? What should I do? Or let me, let me post this on social media, TikTok. Hey, TikTok, let me see what the people will say. Do you like it? Should I do this or should I do? We go to all these different things where I rely on other things instead of God. Another thing that stops us from trusting God is a painful past. How could a loving God allow me to do, go through that? See, we're, our minds and our thoughts, our visions are on the wrong thing. But we'll get to that more in a minute. Another reason people don't trust is they feel far from God. Now, we've been talking about that for the last couple of weeks. Why do we feel far from God? First question I'd ask is how much are you reading and praying? If you're not reading or praying, you're going to feel far from God, period. There's no way around it. No way around it. You have to pick this up and read it for yourself. If you want me to read it to you on Sundays, you're only going to feel close to God for that little bit of time that you're in here. And once you leave, you're going to feel far from him again. But when this word gets inside of you, you don't even need to give him 10 hours a day. It can be 10 minutes a day, and he will grow it. Then, and you're praying, and you, then you will feel close to God. See, then you can start trusting him. But the main reason, the main reason people don't trust God is because they worry. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about right now. Worrying. Worry brings sickness. It brings high level of stress. It leads to people using medications and heart disease. That's what worry does. 
Let me talk to you a little bit about that. Um, not everybody knows me very much, but I was a worry wart. I was a worrier. My son was born, and I was 19 years old, and I was always worried about providing. I was riding a metro to and from work from Southwest Houston all the way to Spring Branch, so probably catching three buses, earning four twenty-five an hour. Whoa! Anybody here want to do that? <laughs> To work six hours to then go to school, and my wife was at home not working at all, and here I had a kid, and so then I'm like, man, how am I going to do this? Man, how am I going to get them out of this neighborhood? How am I going to get them a good house? How am I going to be a good, I mean, I could go on and on. I could make myself do it again, and so all through my 20s, I was worrying, worrying so much that in my early 20s, I had bleeding ulcers, had acid reflux. I couldn't eat them cheesy enchiladas that uh, Aunt Stella makes, man. I had to give all that up. I had to put away the Pepsi. Yeah, I said Pepsi. I had to stop drinking Pepsi, man. I couldn't take it no more. I couldn't do the set. I just, all the stuff that, as you can tell, I like to eat, right? I love it. I had to give all that stuff up. I'm like, man, what is the deal? It's because I was worrying. They wanted to put me on medication. I'm here. I'm 22, 23 years old, and I can't sleep at night because I'm worried, 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 worried. Let me tell you what years of worrying got me. The kids were born. I was 30. Three, that month before I had, was diagnosed with heart disease, blocked arteries, right? Remember that time when I went to the hospital? It was when the Lord healed me on that operating room table. All that stress, all that worrying and thinking and thinking and all, I mean, I could go on and on about all the things. If I let myself do it now, I can start doing it again, but I have to tell my mind to submit to God and so I don't let it go there. So I was worried. It brought me stress. It brought me sickness. It brought me heart disease. The Lord healed me and cured me, and he can do the same for everybody else. But worrying, what it does for us believers is it makes us hopeless. It makes us doubt. It really makes us weak in our faith. And when we're hopeless, when we doubt, and when we're weak in our faith, God can't use you for much. Sometimes you say, man, I want to be used by God, but because you worry so much, you can't. Because you're worried so much, you don't see the person in front of you that needs your help. You're just thinking about yourself, right? You're thinking about what's happening, how I'm in pain, how I'm in these storms. More than likely, everybody's worried about something in here right now. Now, I learned this from my wife. She said, women worry all the time about everything all day long. Men, we don't have that luxury. Our brains would short circuit, explode. But then I also discovered that sometimes people think that if I worry, it shows that I care. That's a lie of the enemy. It shows you're not trusting God. Worrying leads to sin. To think about and to pray for, we're going to get in a second, is different than to worry and stay up all night. When you're worried, you're focused on what's going on right now. You're not, worried, you're not focusing on the promises of God. Worriers spend too much time worrying, and so they don't have time for God because they're just exhausted from all the worrying. Worry steals your joy. It steals your peace from life. And do you know that? Let me tell you this here. There's no warriors in heaven. What are you going to be worried about when you're in heaven? But we got to get there. Right? We got to get there. No warriors in heaven. So, enough of the bad stuff for today. Let's try to get in some good things about trusting. So, I don't want you to answer out loud, but think about this. Do you worry or do you trust? Do you worry or trust? And the one that I'm talking about worrying or trusting, excuse me, is God. Let me ask you. You can answer this question really quickly. What, what do you have a longer list of? Do you have a longer worry list or a longer prayer list? Which one? See, because when you have a prayer list, you're trusting God to answer those prayers, so you're going to him for all these prayers, yours and everybody else's. But if your prayer list goes, and it just rolls out, right? That's your worry list, excuse me. And if your prayer list right, is just a little bitty index card, <laughs> then you are a worrier, and you're not a truster. Today, we're going to talk about becoming a truster. You see, trusting comes from a faithful heart because worrying, it comes from a troubled heart. And I'm going to tell you, man, Jesus, he gives the solution for a wounded and a troubled heart. If you have problems trusting, it's because your heart is wounded. It's because it's troubled. That's why you have a hard time trusting God first. John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus says this, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. You see, the the answer for a wounded and troubled heart is to trust in God, to trust in Jesus. 
And trust is more than a feeling. It's a choice to believe what God's word has to say. And we're going to look at the disciples right now. So go with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. We're going to talk about where Jesus calms the storm, verses 35 through 40. It's a, it's a story that happens early in the ministry of the Lord. He had just uh, brought or uh, named his 12 disciples who were going to follow him. He had started teaching, right? If you look at John, he had already performed a few miracles, you know, but they already knew that they were following somebody special. He was more than just a teacher, that he was a, a great man, that some of, they hadn't announced just yet that he was a son of God, but they were getting to know him early in the ministry. Let's just say six months to a year, right? We had a three, three-year ministry. Some of you right now may be early in your walk with Christ, so put yourself in the disciples' shoes. But they learned early on that they can trust Jesus. And here we go. Mark chapter 4, verse 35, it says, On the same day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him excuse me, along in a boat as he was. The other little boats were also with him. And when the great windstorm arose, and the waves beat on the little boat so that it was already filling up. So what's happening is a, a storm is coming, right? And there's professional fishermen, Peter, um, Andrew, John, and James, we know for sure were professional fishermen. So they've seen storms before. You got it? They've been on the boat before. Now, maybe Matthew, the tax collector, had never seen that, but the other guys had. So you got it. But now this storm is so big that the water is coming inside the boat. That's a pretty major storm, right? Okay, look at this in verse 38. But Jesus was in the stern asleep on a pillow. Oh, what? Hold on a second. When you're asleep, you don't do nothing. You're just resting. It's quiet. There's no action. You're not playing baseball. You're not teaching. You're not doing anything while you're just still, right? Just still. So that's what Jesus is doing. You get in the picture now, right? He's asleep on a pillow. So not only is he asleep, but he's comfortable on a pillow. All right. And they woke him up and they said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Okay, before we go any further. Some of you right now may be facing a storm like that where the water's just coming in. Work is caving in around you. Marriage is falling apart. Kids are disobedient. Family life is a mess. Can't get this for the house. The house my car is breaking. My finances are terrible. Uh, my mind is coming. I need more medication. You got all this stuff coming in and you can't sleep at night. It takes 3 o'clock in the morning and you're tossing and turning. How am I going to pay those bills? Is, is he ever going to love me? Is she ever going to turn back to the Lord? Is, am I, do I have to keep working at this job? And you're just thoughts and thoughts and thoughts and all that water is just coming inside your boat. And so then you look to the Lord. You're like, okay, I go to church. I serve. I read. I pray. I'm walking with God and I don't see nothing. I don't feel nothing. I don't hear nothing. He's not moving things out of my way. And I look to Jesus and say, hey, don't you care? You're sleeping on that piddle, but I'm about to die right now. What's going on with you, Lord? Don't you see all the work and the sacrifice I've done? Don't you hear me, Father? Why are you just laying there? Have you ever felt like that? What is going on, God? Don't you even care that we are about to die? So in verse 39, he arose and he rebuked the wind and he said, peace, be still. Wow. And the, we, the wind, it ceased and there was great calm. That means that's more great calm is even more calm than just regular calm. Okay. I don't even know how to say that. <laughs> great calm. I'm thinking they didn't hear no bugs flying around, that there was nothing but stillness. Boy, that is the power that comes out of our Lord. That is a huge deal. All of a sudden, we think we're about to die. Even the professional fishermen think we are about to die. But he stands up and he says, peace be still. And everything slows down. It's so, it's so great. It's a great calm that's around me now. And then in verse 40, he said to them, but he said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? So he's looking to them. Now, after this, they go on and they say, man, who is this guy that even the wind and the, the seas obey him? The reason I want to stop right here, though, I want you to know that faith and trust go hand in hand. Faith in the Lord. When you, if you say you're a man of faith or a woman of faith, then you have to make yourself 
trust God. Going back to that time that you gave your life to the Lord, the time you were baptized in water, if you were baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, and or these things started happening, you're thinking, man, how come I still don't trust God? I've done all of those things. Why can't I just trust God? It's not just a matter of faith. Sometimes you have to make yourself trust God. And you make yourself trust God by reminding yourself of the things that he has done in your life, the life around others, and the life that is recorded right here in this word. You can see it. It's real. People have tried to deny it. Do you know they found those anchors that they believe that were Paul cut off when he was on that island? I think it was Patmos, I believe is what it was called. They found some anchors right there where they sit. They're like, oh, okay, well, what about this? I did a thing on Noah the other day, a couple of months ago, and then Josh sends me, a, he goes, hey, man, did you see that, that big fish that swallowed that guy for about 30 seconds? You see, all that stuff is real. People try, and they have tried and tried and tried to disprove this word, and they cannot. Why can't they? Because it's real. Because it's truth. Because Jesus is real. Because he is a truth, and because he is real. Because this is real, and because he is truth, I can make myself trust him. Trusting is a choice. It's a choice, brothers and sisters. Are you choosing to trust Jesus? Is that where you are right now? Are you in a storm like these believers, like these disciples? Maybe you're a new believer, and you're thinking, man, he just doesn't care. But I want you to think about this for just a minute. Jesus said, let's get in the boat and go to the other side. They did. So they were following God's will. Got it? They did exactly what he said. And still, they had storms? Hold on, I'm with him, I'm obeying him, I'm following him, and still I have storms in my life? Yes. Because those things don't make you immune from the storms. But when he's with you, he saves you from those storms. They won't harm you anymore. They won't hurt you. Do you see the difference? There's a big difference. I can get through the storms with the Lord. But when I go with the Lord, I won't come out harmed. Everything will be okay. Because, and that I can start trusting. Okay, God, you got me through that before. I remember you got me through situations before, and I wasn't harmed. I was able to get through it. See, so now I can start making myself trust God just a little bit more today than I trust him just yesterday. Anybody here have kids? When the thunderstorms come, who do they run to? They don't run to the neighbor. Why, why don't they run to the neighbor? Why don't they call their teacher and say, hey, teacher it's storming outside they run to mom and dad why because they trust you're going to take care of them when the storms in your life come where do you run where do you run first if you're a child of God then we're supposed to run to our father and we run to our fathers because we trust him if you don't run to him it's because you don't trust him if you don't trust him it's because you just don't know him see the disciples in that scripture that I just read they say who is this they hadn't seen yet all the things. He wasn't on Mount Transfig uh, Trans uh, Transfiguration Mountain up there with Moses. I can't say it right. It's, my tongue's getting tied. He hadn't done that. He hadn't walked on the water. He hadn't raised Lazarus from the dead. He hadn't risen and resurrected from the cross. So they didn't know. They just knew that this was somebody great. You see, you might be right there with Jesus right now. I might believe that he's a Savior because I've been hearing it my whole life. But if you just don't know, it's because you haven't had that encounter with him just yet. All of those other things I talked about, giving your life to the Lord, the baptisms and all that stuff, that is fantastic. That's great. It's professing your faith. But when you have that experience with God, when you know that no matter what anybody says, no matter what any reporters write, that he is who he says he is, that he is Lord and Savior, you see, then you've had that personal experience with him. Now you know him. And when you know him, you will know that his tr word is true. Whether you like it or not, it doesn't matter. But you know his word is true. And when you know his word is true, you can trust him. So I'm telling you, it's a process. Man, it is, brothers and sisters. The storms and the, and the pain that you have in your life, that's not reasons to turn away from God. Those are reasons to turn to God, but we must turn to him first. Maybe by following the Lord, you may think, well, I can't trust him because, you know, when I trusted him, when I followed him, when I obeyed him, when I did everything his word said, my family fell apart, my home fell apart, my church fell apart. I experienced pain and suffering and all of those things. The disciples experienced the same things. 
But still, they trusted in God. They learned how to trust because they knew that he was who he said he was. If you haven't turned to God and stayed with him, it's because you just haven't understood. You just don't get it just yet who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is God himself. If you look at the pains in your life, sometimes we can look at this, and this is another reason for us not to trust God. We say, God, I have all of these pains, all of these things that went wrong. I promise you this, though. If all you look at is that list, you won't see the list that runs on and on and on of all your blessings because the blessings list is way bigger than your worry list and your pain list. Yes, it is. But if you're a worrier, you're just going to look at that list, the pain list, and you won't look at the blessed list. You can go on and on about the blessed list. You can if you make yourself go on and on about the blessed list. I'm telling you this again. You have to make yourself. You have to train yourself to do things, right? I have to train myself to not go to lunch during this weight loss challenge or breakfast with certain people. And they know that I want to. They know. And I'm not going to go with them. I have to train myself and say, I'll see you in the middle of February, okay? (laughs) It's the same way with your mind and your heart. Train yourself. You have to tell yourself. You have to remind yourself. Jesus saved me from that heart disease. He saved me from that relationship. Jesus healed me from here. He gave me enough of this. He he did this for me. He healed that person. He did this. In the Bible, he did that. And on and on and on and on and on. You see, you're reminding yourself and you're telling yourself who the Lord is. When you do that, you can trust him. And when you see that, you'll see all those blessings. Look what Jeremiah 17, 7 says. It says, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. This is how I know that God has blessed you more than the pains that you have. Because he says, blessed are those who trust in the Lord. Blessed. Every Christian, if you ask them, do you want to be blessed? Yeah, of course I want to be blessed. Then trust in the Lord. But I don't trust anybody. I'm not telling about anybody. Trusting God. Trusting God. Trust in God. Look to your neighbor and say, trust in God. Now look to your neighbor and say, I will trust in God. Starts with you confessing. Starts with you talking. Starts with you saying it. I will trust in God. Look what happens when we trust in God. Man, as a child of God, you get ultimate blessings, and the ultimate blessing is salvation. But Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4, it says... You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, Yah, Yahweh, the Lord is everlasting strength. He will keep us in perfect peace. Perfect is mature, it's complete. It's like double peace, right? When I said great calm was like complete I don't even know how to, I don't have the words for that. Well, perfect peace, perfect, it's perfect, it's God. He will keep you there when your mind is stayed on him. Now, who controls what your mind does? Who controls it? You control where your mind goes. I say, well, the enemy throws stuff in there. Yeah, he does, but, you know, you don't have to let it sit on your brain. You don't have to let it sit on your thoughts. You can just let those thoughts just keep on passing. And sometimes it's just you. It's just you. The other day I was trying to do, I had too many things going on in my mind, right? So I'm trying to finish this sermon. Then I start talking about this. Michelle just said, just stop. Can you just finish working on that and get to the other things later? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, so I sit down, put the blinders on, and I focus. See, the same way you can do the same thing. You can put your mind to stay on God. And when you do, you will start seeing things. You'll start hearing things. And brothers and sisters, you can start trusting him. Perfect peace is that double peace, but you have to trust in God to get it. Jesus himself will keep you in that perfect peace. This is what he did with the disciples. It was a great calm. They were in perfect peace because they were with him. Trust is a choice. It's a choice you make up in your mind and in your heart. What's the choice that you're making? You see, if you look for reasons to not trust God, you'll find some. Just like if you look for reasons to not trust a person or people, you'll find them. Let's talk about people, even though I wasn't going to preach about trusting people, just as an example. 
Like I said, if one doctor does something wrong, well, well, all doctors are like that. You can always find a reason. In any profession, anywhere, doing anything, are you going to have a crooked doctor, a crooked lawyer? Yes or no? Crooked teacher? Crooked principal? Yeah. Crooked uh, fast food worker? Crooked pastor? Oh, well, hold on a second. But you don't stop going to the fast food restaurants or the doctors. You don't stop going to school. You don't stop going to your AT&T wireless mobile. So why do you stop going to church just because one person that shouldn't have been in that position anyway, because that probably wasn't their calling, decided to do something crazy and broke your trust? We also do that with God. Well, God, you, ah, I prayed that I, my dad would get healed and he wouldn't die and he still passed away. I can't trust you, God. You're like all the other gods. What about all the other blessings that you have? What about everything else? See, we do that, right? Because why? Because we're trying to control ourselves, man. I know, I know I'm in control. I'm in control. When you do that, brothers and sisters, you messed out on the blessed life that God has for you. He's the one that keeps you in perfect peace. That peace comes from an absence of guilt. There's no conflict. There's no turmoil in your life that you can't overcome. That's the perfect peace he's talking about. If you hold on to those things, then your life is going to be full of stress, full of worry, and full of chaos. If right now your life is defined by that more than double peace or a great calm, then you're not trusting God. I'm showing you this so you can ask yourself. I'll tell you, last week, man, I was hooping and hollering all, speaking over here in the spirit and everything. And this week, I'm, it's, it's a challenge, man. It's challenging the way we think. The word of God corrects. It challenges. It, it shows us who we really are. It's a reflection of who we are. So I'm asking you to ask yourself, is your life defined by worry, stress, and chaos or peace, strength, and joy? What is it defined as? What would your kids say? What would you say honestly? And if it's not of the fruit of the Spirit, then it's because you're not trusting God. You're trusting the wrong things. If you hold on to those things, you're gonna end your, your life will end sooner. I don't think anybody wants that, do they? I'm sure you're here because you feel like, man, there's still something else I got to do. I got to raise my kids. I want to see my grandkids. Uh, God's calling me to do something in ministry. Uh, I got to get that promotion at work. There's something else. You see, a disciple's life is not described, a true disciple, by worry, stress, or chaos. It's described as being full of victory, full of blessings, and perfect peace in the midst of the storms. That's a disciple. Disciples, they didn't want the storms. And I tell you the reason that they didn't want the storms was because they're like, hey, God, Jesus, wake up. What? They didn't want it. They're like, we're with this guy, and he's got a pillow. I want to sleep like that. I don't want these storms. Does anybody here want storms in their life? I mean, if you do, let's pray afterwards. Nobody does, right? No, nobody. It's uncomfortable. I don't like it. I don't want it. You see, but Jesus got them through it, and he can get you through it as well. Do you trust him? Trust him first. The disciples got through it because they knew the Lord, and they had to learn to trust him. Here's the great thing about the Lord is he's patient with you. And he might say, you know what? You've been a believer for 15 years, but you still just don't trust me, do you? I'm going to teach you how to trust me. Just walk with me. I'm going to show you how to trust me. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. I was asking the Lord, man, should I share this or not before we're doing praise and worship? So I'm going to, I tell you, I'm a a warrior. I was in my 20s. So I got into operations management. Operations, when you do this, you look at the best possible outcome and the worst. And I'm always telling the leaders, I'm always looking at What's the worst thing that can happen and what's the best thing that can happen? Well, recently, you know, I started thinking about, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? What's the worst? In a certain situations here. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about it. I wasn't going to mention it, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about it. So we have a year to find another place. Okay. A few of the leaders here know. But on Christmas Eve, the owner of the building said, hey, you guys got to go. You know, we're going to restart the church again. He's an international evangelist, and he's going to come here. 
And we don't own this building. We've leased it for seven years. Praise God, we've had a place for seven years. And so at first I was excited. I'm like, that treasure's out there for us, right? The treasure's out there. We've got to go find it. We've got to go find it. Tell them the folks. That was four weeks ago. And somewhere around two weeks ago, I started thinking, man, okay, where are we going to go? How are we going to get there? We don't have enough money to buy anything. Our places, you know, some of the places that you could rent and lease are crazy expensive. And then what area are we going to be in? And what about this? And what about that? And here I am, and boom, and boom, and boom. And then I call Mike Cortez, you know, Mike, one of my mentors. And I'm like, dude, I'm having problems sleeping at night. He said, what are you worried about? I'm not worried about nothing. He goes, what are you stressed about? I said, dude, I'm not even stressed. I'm just thinking. He goes, oh, you're thinking. <laughs> what are you thinking about? Well, I'm thinking about if we move, are those people going to come with us? If we do this, are they, is this going to happen? If I tell the church, are the people going to say, ah, forget it, we're leaving? I mean, how's the place going to look? Are people going to think it's too much money? Are people going to invest? Are people not invest, but are going to give? I mean, and so I'm telling him, he goes, what are you worried about? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, what am I worried about? The Lord has brought us through floods. He's brought us through so much, man. We started in, a, in my living room. Come on, man. We've had people pass away in here. We've had people fall and hurt themselves in this building. We've had robbed. We've been robbed here. We've, I can go on and on. We've had all kinds of stuff happen inside the church building and outside the church building. We've had heartbreak within the, I mean, and none of those things the pandemic, oh my gosh, we, we didn't have service for five, six months, right? It was just online. And through all of those things, Dayspring is still here. Why is that? Yes, praise God. Yeah. Yes, praise God. And I'm going to say this, stronger than ever, by the way, stronger than ever. You remember that, that one anniversary celebration we had? It was packed in here. I don't even know how we had chairs in there. He might look and say, well, that was strong, man. No, right now it's stronger than ever. Stronger. And so I backed up and I said, okay, Lord, I'm like looking too much for leases and land and buildings. And I'm doing this with the bank and I'm doing that. And I'm like, I'm not pastoring. I'm not. So I wasn't trusting God to take care of this. And we got to do our part, of course. But I was trying to do what Peter likes to do, take on things myself, trying to build that stage without God and then ask him to bless it afterwards. That's what Peter was trying to do. So I backed up. People invited me to go to eat with them. And probably a week and a half ago, I would have said, man, I'm too busy. I can't. But this time I said, no, 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 no. Yes, let's do that. Met with this person, met with that person. Then I remember this one phone call came. And I'm telling you this with, for a reason. I know we're running a little late, but guys, uh, just please hang with me for just a moment. Boys and Girls Country, the orphanage, right? Y'all know that we've been supporting them. And so um, working with them for a couple of years. And so Vince, he calls me. Vince is the director, the CEO, and he calls me up on Friday. He leaves me a message and he goes, I know it's short notice, but I, I want to see if you can do something for me. And I said, before I call him back, I said, Lord, whatever he wants me to do, I'm going to say yes. Whenever it is, I'm going to say yes. I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm not. I'm telling you all this because this is how, when I first started the church, that's how it was with God. You tell me to go left, I'm going to go left. You tell me to go straight, I'm going to go straight. By the way, doing that is how I found this place. I asked God, take me to the building you want me to be in. The other place told us we had to leave at the end of the month. And the Lord, he told me, left, right, straight, stop sign here. And then he brought me right here to this place, right? Okay. So I had that experience with God, trusting him like that. So I started saying, okay, yes, I'm right. So then he says, yeah, can you come and do this uh, teaching for all of the leaders at, at this other church? And I was like, yes, absolutely. What day, what time? Boom, he gives me the date and time. Yes, I'll be there. It's this week. Not a problem, man. I'm doing it. And I told him, I said, it didn't matter what you were going to ask me or when I was going to do it. Because I had already told God, I'm trusting that God's going to take care of everything else. Because see, when I'm obedient with God and walking like that, me personally, I'm talking about me, then he takes care of everything else, everything else. So then people were calling me, and some of you were calling me, and when I'm doing my sermon, I don't answer. 
because I'm like, I'm, I'm trying. Well, that's the half the time I don't answer. Sometimes I still answer, but this time if y'all called, I'm like, I'm picking up, I'm picking up. And there was a point where Nadine was trying to get a hold of me for two days. I had two lines going. I had to charge my phone three different times. My phone would not stop ringing, and I kept answering. I kept answering. You got a minute, Pastor? You got a minute? Yes, I got a minute. Yes, I got a minute. Why? Because God created me. He called me to be a pastor, not to be a builder, not to find some land to be a real estate agent. That's not what he called me to be. He called me to be a pastor, so I'm going to do that. I'm trusting the Lord that he is going to get us in the right place, in the right place time and all of that and that he's going to do it i have to make myself trust him i'm sharing all that because it's not about me guys please it's think about you where are you right now with trusting god are you trusting him with your future are you trusting him with your spouse are you trusting him with your kids are you trust him with your health with your money with your jobs with your talent with your future are you trusting him? because if you're not then your trust is in the wrong place and all you're going to keep doing is getting the same old things you've always gotten and by the way when you keep getting the same things over and over again the older you get the worse it gets because you know that time is gone but god has got some great things for you the college is starting again you know how many ministries we've started? You know how many associate pastors we got coming up that are getting credentialed, that'll be credentialed in just a few months? A couple of them. <laughs> Why would God be bringing more pastors into a church? It's because he's about to do something great. And this next group of people is coming. I think there's, I don't even know, a dozen or so maybe students are registered so far for this. But I know there's going to be more. And why do I know that? Because I trust God. He gave me the vision seven years ago. This was going to be a training ground for other ministries and other churches. That pastors were going to come from here. And of course, this was going to be a training center. It was going to be all this. And it wasn't because Peter wanted to do those things. No. Do y'all know that I gave up a $120,000 job to do this? To get $300 a month in gas to drive me around? What kind of insane person would do something like that? Anybody here want to do that? Anybody here want to give up your current salary to get $300 a month for gas? No? Well, then why? Because I'm trusting God to take care of me. And yes, he did. He gave my wife a promotion. She wasn't a principal when I started this. But God promoted her. Right? And then we have a house that we bought for 27 years. And all of that money, right, that we've been paying hard, by the way, for 27 years. We're able to sell the house. And now we're able to get this accurate. If you look and say, man, he's just taking the church's money. Man, I give more money than anybody else in this church. What are you talking about? I would just be taking it from myself. It's not like that. That car come from the house that we sold that me and Michelle had worked 27 years to pay. See, I don't need all that. Now, you might look and say, but well, what about that pastor did that? Well, that's, they got to answer to God for that. I'm answering to God for what I'm doing. And if you don't know me, then get to know me. I'll be happy to share with you who I am, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? Because there's plenty of all of that to go around. The goofy, you know, when I get tired and hungry, right, Ivan? I'm just goofy. I mean, my jokes aren't even funny, not even to me anymore. That's how silly I get. I start dancing when ice cream comes because I just love it. If you want to know the goofy part, I'll show you the goofy part of me. But the other serious part of me is that I trust God and I absolutely love him. Now, where are you in your life? Do you want it to be better than it was yesterday? Start trusting God. Find little reasons to trust him. It's simple. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to challenge you guys. It's 2022. Find a reason today to trust God. One reason today. And find a different reason tomorrow. And then a different reason tomorrow. To start trusting him. And then on and on and on. You can start by thanking him. You can start by reminding yourself of the things that he has done. But there are so many reasons to trust God. You literally, if you thought of one reason a day, could go for 10, maybe 20 years on something different every single day on a reason to trust God. Now, I can't make you do that. I challenged some of you three months ago to fall completely head over heels in love with God. I didn't even ask you if he did. But it would show in your life if, it did, if he did. And why am I doing that? For my benefit? I'm not going to put up a plaque that says this person fell in love. No, it's not for me. It's for you. I'm not up here for me to glorify myself. I can't stand the way I look on camera. I argued about going on Facebook until we had no choice but to do it. I don't like the way I sound. And Mr. Um, Internet Radio there said, it's okay, you got a, a 
Orlando's telling me, you got a voice that could be on the radio, right? I got the, I got the face for radio where nobody sees it. I'm short. I'm fat. I'm balding. The young man over there, he's got this cool mohawk. I said, man, I wish I had hair like that so I could do a mohawk. So I don't like all this. I'm studying for my glory. I became a pastor because it's for God's glory. When y'all look at this, y'all say, well, if he can do it to that, then he can do something in my life. And the answer is, yes, God can. He can do something greater in your life, and I hope he does something greater in your life than you have seen in mine. Are y'all ready for that? Whatever your trials are, whatever your problems are, whatever the things that are holding you back from trusting God, go to God, not anybody else, and say, God, why can't I trust you? And then be quiet. Don't pick up your phone. Don't turn on TV. Just listen. And whatever he says, do it. Whatever. Some of you are going to argue that off. The first thought when you're in prayer with God is from him. The second one is from you or the enemy, and the third one is, well, the second one's from you, the third one's from the enemy. Don't listen to the second or third one. That's going to be the one that says, do it this way instead. That's the enemy's specialty. The first one, do that, and then you'll start trusting God. Are you all ready to start trusting God? Amen. Let's all stand up as we close out in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. I'm ready to start trusting God first, brothers and sisters. Trust God first. Find reasons every day to trust the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you, God, again for this beautiful day, Lord, and thank you for the hearts and minds of everybody that's here today. Lord, I pray that you truly challenge the people here today to start trusting you. There is no greater thing. Father, I wish I could share everything with them that reasons to trust but they've got to find it on their own if you are a stranger to them Lord it's because they're not reading enough and they're not praying enough so church if Jesus is a stranger to you start reading more the Bible start praying more in fellowship come around people that are serving and worshiping the Lord he's always going to be a stranger if you don't seek him but when you seek him you will find him and when you find him he'll get you through the storms and when he gets you through the storms you'll see that you can start trusting him. Father, I pray for the people that are here, Lord God. I pray that they walk out of here knowing that they are a child of God. They don't have to have their heads held down, uh, hanging down anymore, Lord. You're a wonderful God. Lord, I know there's some people here that have had some terrible things happen in their life. They've been betrayed by a spouse or they've been hurt by their kids or their family just turned away from them. They've been let go from their favorite jobs. They've lost everything. Their health is deteriorating. I know there's so many different things, God. I get it, Father. But Lord, they're still alive. You've kept them in that boat alive. And I know the water may be coming. All they need to do is go to you so that you can turn to the storm in their life and say, peace, be still. Father God, and I know you'll do it because your word is true. I believe your word, and I hope that they can start believing in your word. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for a beautiful week. I thank you for an empowering week, a week where everybody here will take one day, every day, and they find another reason to trust you, Lord, something to give you thanks for. Father, I pray for the rest of this day, the rest of this week, Lord, that's coming up. I thank you, God, that you cover everybody who's here, Lord, and everybody who's not able to make it due to sickness, Father God. And we pray, Lord Jesus. We pray for the future of Dayspring. So, Father, I thank you again and again for all you're doing. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.